become a gloomy Friday. Um, so I am not doing the big honors. I'm going to do the second big honors. Um, I'm going to introduce the person who's introducing Felipe. So Sandra uh, Salgado is a PhD student in sociology, and she's my student, so I'm going to claim credit uh, for her. She's doing uh, some wonderful research. She is studying the social and economic integration of Nuevo Mexicanos, Chicanos, Mexican Americans in uh, New Mexico. And it's a very exciting project, really struggling with the issues around racialization of Mexican origin folks. And most importantly, Cassandra defended her uh, orals for her dissertation proposal this yeah. morning. Yeah. So I get to tell you guys that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Cassandra will now introduce our speaker. Hi everyone, I'm Cassandra. Um, I'm very excited to introduce um, the speaker for today, Felipe Gonzalez, who is a professor of sociology at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Um, his research areas are in race and ethnicity, Mexican Americans and other Latino populations in the US, as well as collective behavior and social movements. His two recent books are an edit edited anthology um, titled Expressing Culture, Nuevo Mexicano, Creativity, Everyday Ritual, and Collective Remembrance. And his other book um, in 2001 is titled For Sacrifice as Ethnic Protest, The Hispano Cause in New Mexico and the Racial Attitude Confrontation of 1933. And his pr presentation today is titled Politica, The Forced Annexation and Political Integration of the Nuevo Mexicanos from 1832 to 1871. And I also wanted to take a little time to thank our sponsors, who are um, the Department of Sociology's Race and Ethnicity Working Group, uh, the UCLA Cesar E. Chavez Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies, uh, UCLA Chicana and Chicano Studies Research Center, UCLA's Department of Sociology Contentious Politics and Organizations Working Group, and the UCLA Department of Sociology Irene Flock. Flecno Ross Lecture Series, which is made possible by a gift from Ray Ross in memory of his wife. So if we can have a round of applause before Felipe comes up. Thank you, Cassandra, and uh, thanks to you and to Vilma, Professor Ortiz, for making this visit possible. Uh, thanks to the programs that are hosting my presentation today, and thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'd like to start out by saying a little bit more about myself, especially since I'm a sociologist who's doing quite a bit of historical stuff, and when I say this historical stuff, I am getting very deeply into some historical materials and telling what I consider to be very important and interesting stories. So I'm a sociologist. In many ways, I'm a conventional sociologist. I look at contemporary issues having to do with identity and ethno-racial mobilization and so forth. But I also come from a group of Chicanos and Chicanas who went through the sociology department at UC Berkeley in the 1970s. And there were a number of us who developed an interest in Mexican-American Chicano history. And some of the more prominent ones included David Montejano, although David was not a graduate student at Berkeley at the time. He was an assistant professor, an acting assistant professor in Berkeley, but you know, we, that was okay. We brought him into the group anyway. <laughs> um, Tomas Armaguer and Jorge Chapa. Now, uh, what was very interesting is that um, each one of us tended to develop a particular research interest in the home state that we were from. Mm -hmm. So, David is from San Antonio, and he ended up writing his prize-winning Anglos and Mexicans in the, in the making of Texas. Tomas is originally from Moore Park, outside of Santa Barbara, and he ended up writing racial fault lines, the historical origins of white supremacy in California, again, focusing on 19th century um, California. Jorge Chapa is from Chicago, and he did stuff on Mexican Americans, especially Mexican immigrants in the Midwest. He didn't continue with a book that was strictly historical. Nevertheless, some of his early stuff was 
had to do with the history of Mexican Americans in the uh, uh, in the Midwest. So it went on like that. And so of course I uh, began uh, looking into the history of Mexican Americans in my home state of New Mexico. And so and so um, I am uh, bringing uh, that stuff finally to fruition. In some ways, I feel like the tortoise to their hair, you know, <laughs> because they got their stuff out, you know, uh, so early. Um, and nevertheless, uh, th the, the finish line is, is very, very close, and I'll explain that here in a minute. Um, now, uh, David and uh, and Tomas uh, did their studies under their particular sociological lens. It's gonna, and th th those lenses differed between those two guys, and mine is going to differ from those two. So uh, David, for example, had his reasons for using a, a sort of quasi-Marxist class analysis in order to, in order to 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 analyze the eventual social subordination of Tejanos. And Tomas used very much of a Iberian perspective in order to look at the, the, the decline of the status of the Californios in 19th century California. I uh, am going to use or am using the old classic internal colonial perspective, which was the one that, that was developed at that particular time. It's had a little bit of a checkered history since then. But I think that, that it's entirely appropriate for looking at the experience of the no, no Mexicanos in the, in the 19th century. Although, I'm going to be giving that framework a, a, a particular twist, as, as we shall see. So, um, this then is the title of my project. And it is a book-length manuscript. and. The review of it is going very well, and so it looks like it's going to go into production early next year. Very much looking forward to that, because um, I've been working on this project for half my life, it feels like. <laughs> um, so as you can see, it has to do with the uh, no Mexicanos, that is, the Mexican natives to New Mexico, those Mexicans who were native to New Mexico when it became part of the United States in the 19th century. And the time frame goes from 1821 to 1871. I think that Cassandra said 1830s, and that's because I changed it after I had sent her the, the uh, <laughs> this thing is constantly morphing and changing. Uh, the, other, the other change, if you are remembering the announcement and the advertisement, is that this word was incorporation in the ad, and so it has since become integration, and I'll explain that for a bit in a bit. Um, 1821 to 1871, and so transformative, very important transition years, and in fact years that involved the formation of the Mexican-American social category to begin with, and it encompasses the, uh, in the American invasion of Mexico that took place in 1846. It encompasses the two-year war between the United States and Mexico that ended in 1848 with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Um, and it goes on to 1871, which means that the history goes into the, the territorial, the American territorial period of New Mexico history. Now, that's, that's very important in terms of what I'm going to be calling the colonial situation or the internal colonial situation, very appropriate, because, as we know, Texas was made a state of the American Union in 1845, and in fact, it uh, was one of the sparks of the war between the United States and Mexico, whereas California was made a state in 1850, two years after the end of the Mexican-American War. By contrast, New Mexico remained a territory until 1912. And so that, technically speaking, it was a colony of the United States. And it's in that context, then, that the concept of internal colonialism is, is quite appropriate and is one of the reasons why it is that my sociological analysis of Mexican American history would be different than what David Matejano or Tomás Armaguer uh, would, uh, would undertake to do. So now, uh, keeping with the title here, then what is intended is a certain tension 
between this phrase, uh, this one, forced annexation, and this one, integration. So that the idea of a forced annexation is a conflict-laden term that in this particular historical case involved conquest and the forced incorporation of Mexicans as a result of an imperial war. And that also implies then a system of social domination in which both the American state and colonial settlers from the United States into New Mexico held social dominance over the conquered Mexicans. This term then is a more positive consensus suggestion, especially in terms of the uh, American political vernacular, because it is one that uh, suggests social inclusion, the inclusion of outgroups, the inclusion of African Americans, for example, in as a result of the civil rights movement or the vernacular that arose in the context of the civil rights movement and the extension of civil and political rights. So that's what integration tends to suggest within the American historical context. So that is then the reconciliation that I am seeking to make in this particular study between the uh, forced incorporation of these Mexicans into the American polity or the American state, and certain processes of integration that I will argue were, were part of that, uh, of their um, experience. So another uh, sociologist who has done um, important work in Mexican American history is of course Laura Gomez, who's on the faculty here at UCLA, both in the sociology department and the law school. I think her primary appointment is in the, uh, is in the law school. Uh, but she has a recent work that came out called Manifest Destinies. By the way, I should mention that I know Lara Gomez also because she was raised in Albuquerque. And I've known Lara since she was, she'd probably be embarrassed to hear me say this, but I've <laughs> known her since she was like, you know, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. Her father and I, uh, were undergraduates at the University of New Mexico in the late uh, 1960s and early 1970s. Um, and we've become close friends ever since. And in fact, Lana's dad also went to Berkeley sociology. Um, he decided not to go on to a PhD. He got his MA in sociology and then he went back to, uh, to New Mexico uh, to work at the University of New Mexico. So. Um, Manifest Destinies has its own way of characterizing the tension between integration and forced annexation. And if you've read the book, then you know that she, she does this by calling the relationship between the dominant Anglo-Americans in New Mexico and the subordinated no Mexicanos as one of, of power sharing. Um, and so, uh, what I do, uh, a little bit beyond what, what Lara does in her book, is I, I give this quite a bit of emphasis. Uh, this idea of um, power sharing goes against the grain what sociologists tend to have found in cases of internal colonialism when you have a dominant state that reaches out and rips off the territory of a neighboring country. Um, Power sharing is generally not understood as the, the result of that kind of expropriation of a foreign uh, country's piece of land. And, and the example that I'd like to use is Michael Hector's cultural division of labor. And in the cultural division of labor, what happens in internal colonialism is there's a very strict segregation between the dominant overseers and the uh, conquered subordinates very strict segregation and the reason is that the conquest of these lands generally has an economic motivation that is the idea is to is to extract resources from the conquered territories for use in the in, in the uh, metropole um, and so there's this primary uh, prime
primary function of the exploitation of labor of the conquered in order to in order to um, in order to extract these resources for for the center obviously not what happened in New Mexico now New Mexico is a case of internal colonialism and conquest just like many others across the world but internal colonialism obviously is a concept in which there are variations across particular cases the idea that uh, that power sharing should be part of that uh, part of that circumstance of internal colonialism then is a um, is a uh, pretty uh, pretty special one um, so now what Lara does in manifest destinies is it is that she examines empirically power sharing from the standpoint of the judicial system that was established in New Mexico, the American judicial system that was established in 19th century New Mexico. And she notes, for example, that, that the conquered Mexicans tended to dominate in, for example, juries. And they often then would decide on the fates of Anglo-American uh, defendants. So for her, and she looks, she does a greater analysis of the judicial system and territory in New Mexico. So that's her empirical case for analyzing and dealing with power sharing in, um, in territory of New Mexico. What I do, uh, part of the effect of my work is to augment Laura's work by shifting the empirical lens from the judicial institution to the conventional political system. And um, in doing that then, what, um, what appears is a pattern of substantial political participation on the part of the Mexicans, you know, who were conquered in 1848. Substantial political participation. And so, um, and so that is the primary empirical finding that I have on my hands and that I want to analyze and consider. Now, substantial significant political participation can be seen on three levels. On one level is the local uh, government, uh, uh, local, local government operations, the county political system, the, the, the town and village governance structures, in the historic New Americano homeland counties, and even in some in which uh, Euro Americans were starting to filter in and whose population started to grow, uh, it was critical. And these were very important levels of political participation and governance. The probate judge in 19th century New Mexico was an extremely important local office. And there were others. There was a sheriff, a county sheriff. These were all Mexicans who were filling these positions. There was a justice of the peace, and then there were also then electoral officials that were that were very important. So that's one level of um, local of, a, of a, um, political power sharing. Second level is the territorial legislature. So in the American territorial system, there was an elected territory representing different districts within the within the uh, within the with the territory and throughout 19th century New Mexico the overwhelming number of, of, of uh, uh, representatives on the council and on the House of Representatives of New Mexico it was in like 85 percent clear up until the 20th century now some have argued that the territorial legislature is not a very important office and because the laws that it passed could have been vetoed by the governor and even by Congress. But I argue it was an extremely important institution. For one thing, they did pass laws. And the citizens of the territory had, had to obey those laws. And second of all, it was an extremely important venue for the participation of the Mexicans in the American political context. And uh, Carolyn Zeleny has made this observation that in fact, the territory was an important basis for the distribution of power within the, uh, within the territory, with the Mexicans controlling the territorial legislature and the Anglo-Americans controlling the federal appointments coming down from Washington. 
The third uh, important level of significant, substantial Mexican participation in American polity is in relationship to the delegate to Congress. Now, in the, in the American system of territories, the territory does not have representation in the U.S. Senate nor in the U.S. Congress. Instead, it has a delegate to Congress. This is true today. Puerto Rico, for example, has a delegate to Congress, but no membership in the U.S. Senate. I mean, um, uh, yeah, Puerto Rico, yeah. Uh, no U.S. Senators or no U.S. Congressmen, but a, but a representative to, uh, uh, to Congress. And it's true that the delegate does not have a vote in Congress. Nevertheless, it is, it is the main connection between the residents of the territory and the uh, um, and, 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 and Washington. An extremely important position, especially since in, it's an elected position. Now, so now I'm going to show you an illustration of uh, significant political participation at the level of delegate to Congress. So, the election for delegate to Congress took place every two years, just like it, just like, you know, the election for congresspersons today takes place every two years. And so the first one, was in 1851, and this was because for two years New Mexico was ruled by the military. And it, it wasn't until 1850 that it became a federal incorporated territory. So in the first election uh, for delegate to Congress then, we had these uh, Euro-American settlers, Richard uh, Whiteman, and these two guys, Steve Messer V. And here, this should be in black. So that's a Typo right there. Although, since it's not bolded, maybe that you know that makes that makes some difference there. Uh, Otero then um, becomes the dominant uh, person in the office of delegate to Congress for three uh, straight terms. Um, now it's a complicated history here, and so it's not always that the Mexicans could surface as the one party's candidate for, and I'll ex go into that here in a bit. And so, in 1861 then, John S. Watts defeats uh, Diego Rechuleta. After that then, we go back to the pattern of no Mexicanos who are basically kicking butt in the, in the position. Uh, Gallegos is still, you know, still got his ambitions and in fact, any political scientists in the crowd here? So one of the theories of American politics is ambition theory, which argues that the American political system really runs on the ambitions of people who strive to be candidates. And there are a little bit of ambition processes that are going on here that the Mexicans pick up on during the, during the 19th century. Um, and so it goes down, Charles Cleaver then, this was a very dramatic um, race for delegate to Congress which I feature, uh, actually, to tell you the truth, um, I'm gonna, when I show you the table of contents, you're gonna see that what I've got here is a little bit of a beast of a manuscript, and one of the reasons is that I decided to tell the story of each one of these, of each one of these elections. Um, now, so I have this line drawn across the 1871 election and because my book focuses on this period, or it technically ends in this period, although my conclusion does speak to the um, period that followed 1871. But, it, but I decided to leave this in here in order to demonstrate the dominance of Mexicans in the office of delegate to Congress. Um, this, was, this guy was a very powerful guy who ends up leaving New Mexico and becomes a U.S. Senator from West Virginia. But so, while well, he was here, then he was able to develop quite a bit of, quite a bit of, uh, of power. Now, one of, the, one of the things that's an indication uh, of um, integration, um, I can mention now, is that these guys, Elkins, Watts, Baird, uh, Lane, Reynolds, and Wayman, there's no way they could have even been in the running for delegate to Congress if they did not have the support of the Mexican voters. And so the process of, uh, process of establishing coalitions and working with Mexican leaders was an extremely important part of the, of the system 
of electoral politics and territorial New Mexico. So, so the next question for, for me, and I think basically for a sociologist, is once they've laid out something that they want to explain, is that, or they've laid out some empirical pattern, is they ask the question, so what explains this? I mean, historians have their ways of asking that question, but sociologists tend to be in your face about, you know, ahead of time. They want to be able to tell you, this is my theoretical framework for explaining the particular pattern that we are studying. And so, um, and so I asked that question. Um, in the context of a internal colonial situation, what is it that explains this substantial, significant level of Mexican political participation? And so one of the things that I do then is that I read Laura's Manifest Destiny in order to see what she has to say about this. And I abstract a, I think I think what she's saying is that there's a, a three-pronged explanation for why it is that you would have power sharing um, at this particular time and place. Number one was that the Euro-Americans -Ameri Euro who were taking control of New Mexico had a pra pragmatic need to set up a government administrative system. Um, in a piece of land that had been acquired by the United States. Now, one of the circumstances that's different about New Mexico is, is the demographic uh, relations, so that Mexicans remain the majority of the population uh, throughout the 19th century. And so, if they're going to set up a governing system in the territory, they need the Mexican. And there's, there's just no, no, no way around it. It was not so much that they were being, you know, inclusionist or liberal about it. Okay, all right, fine, you're here, so we need you, so let's, let's get it on, let's build this governing system. Sort of logic. Um, the second part of her explanation is that the allowance of Mexicans to participate in these important institutional frameworks was a way of legitimating the American conquest. So, and this indeed is an aspect that arises in every instance of imperial conquest. And you have one country that conquers another, another uh, a piece of territory, then it's important to be able to get the um, the recognition and the legitimation from those who are conquered. And so she, and, and you know, this is, there are theories of hegemonic colonialism that are used in order to account for this in Puerto Rico, for example, and in, in other places. That is, you make the effort to build institutions in order to get buy-in from the conquered so they can accept the fact that their homeland has been conquered and you have an invasion of foreign in institutions into their land. And then the third part of her theory uh, is, that, um, is that New Mexico was class stratified to begin with. And so, and there was a, 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 a class system in the Mexican period that was incorporated into the United States wholesale. And so it was in the interest of the upper class, the landed upper class of New Mexico, to profit from the system, the social system, that was being established by the United States. And so the, uh, the elites um, had in their particular interests the idea of collaborating and working with the American government in order to preserve their power within what was already an established class system. This tends to argue that there was a pretty sharp separation between the uh, North American elites and the lower classes uh, of the uh, Mexican population. So, um, what I do in, in my uh, research is that I'm very much interested in how um, power sharing and political integration 
and Mexican political participation actually took place as part of the political process. So I examine the records in order to see who was doing what, which groups were being formed, how were coalitions being established, how were oppositions you know, being, being defined. It's a very close-knit, grounded approach that I take in looking at this whole experience. And as I did that, and I'm going through, you know, the uh, chronology of uh, the development of politics in, in the territory, then I start to perceive an overarching complex becoming very important. And I'm giving this uh, complex the name of Enlightenment Liberalism. And so, and so uh, th that is then a major shtick in the research that, um, that uh, I am conducting. So uh, then I see then Enlightenment liberalism, in a sense, playing an extremely important role in facilitating and in providing the means for Mexicans to participate participate in the American political system. And by an enlight enlightenment liberal complex, I mean uh, basically uh, two important things. And one is enlightenment ideology. The, uh, let me see. The liberal integrator complex is what I'm calling it. And so, the uh, liberal integrative complex then is divided into two major parts. One is the enlightenment ideology, and second is integrative mechanisms. So, 1846, 1848, now, you know, that was not that uh, far in advance of the French Revolution, the rise of enlightenment thought the American Revolution that was based very much on Enlightenment ideas and very much, you know, in relationship to, to the, to the uh, 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 great English Revolution as well. So what is going on here in the United States and in most of the West, Western societies is um, Enlightenment thought that is, that is infusing and informing the, 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 the political systems. And this is basically a reform kind of ideology that's challenging, especially the monarchies, but also uh, conservative uh, enlightenment uh, states and, uh, and, and monarchies. Um, and, so, um, and so one of the things then that I'm going to be marking out in this book is how it is that enlightenment thought and liberal thought in the United States diffused into the United States and facilitated the political integration of the Mexicanos. <coughs> That's not the entire story because there was also some Enlightenment aspects to uh, New Mexico when it was part of Mexico. But in comparison, the Enlightenment complex of the United States was much more robust than it was in Mexico. Um, and so uh, the reform vernacular, and so one of the things then that I find as I looked at all of these political contentions um, and political processes was an, ex an extremely large amount of rhetoric informed by the Enlightenment. And so I'm going to give you some examples of that here in a bit when, I, when we get to the chapters of the book. Second are integrative mechanisms. And so the integrative mechanisms there are, in, in, in effect, uh, give life to the Enlightenment ideology. There are a number of mechanisms that were very important and that facilitated the Euro Mexicano political participation. One of them was citizenship. The fact that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo gave the Mexican citizenship, I contend, was an extremely important development. Now, us critical Chicano scholars, we tend to, to regard this, uh, you know, aspect of, of history uh, cynically. That is, we tend to say, 
yeah, 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 sure, they gave us citizenship, but then, like, then they went and racialized us and dominated us and so on and so forth. Well, that's true, uh, but it varied across the Southwest. And so I am arguing that the, uh, the substantial, significant political participation in the nomadic Canada could not have taken place without the awarding of citizenship. And in fact, as a liberal doctrine, as a, a liberal theory, the Nomehikanos themselves used citizenship in their own uh, interests within the political system. And so it obviously meant a lot to them. And they used it when they, when they struggled for their own. Second, popular suffrage. The fact of the matter is Mexico did not have popular elections in the same way that the United States did. They had limited elections, and what was called a kind of electoral college in which the elites voted for themselves, you know, for the for the, for the assembly in, in 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 the Mexican department, but the United States had popular so citizenship then led to popular elections, an extremely important liberal mechanism for incorporating the Americanos, and finally and extremely importantly in terms of the narrative that I'm going to tell, is going to be the uh, liberal political party. Now, one of the things I'm not afraid of incorporating into my work is what is called modernization theory. And, and, and I don't consider modernization theory to be all and end all for explaining the incorporation of our groups or the conquest of our groups. But there is this concept of the uh, party of integration. And so the idea that the classic Western political party had the kinds of capacities to be able to bring in outgroups into the political system. And you can, it's not difficult to imagine this, right? What's the function of a political party? It's to, it's to recruit voters in order to vote for your particular candidate or whatever. Um, so, so those are the three principal integrative mechanisms that I see operating in New Mexico. Um, that facilitated um, substantial political um, participation. The thing is, though, that, and here's where it gets a little bit tricky, and I've already had one uh, friend review my introduction, uh, and he makes the comment that it's that I'm giving the impression that the United States was a wholly integrative and equal and, you know, the American creed and, you know, very much in the way that, uh, that uh, the incorporation of European uh, immigrants uh, took place. And so I can see now that I'm going to have to beef up this part of the introduction in order to stress the argument that this whole complex of integration within an enlightenment context occurred within a greater shell of colonial relations or colonial system. And so that's the trick for me, is to be able to reconcile these two dominant structures of relationships within the, within the 19th century. Uh, Cassandra, are you going to let me know on my time, how I'm doing time-wise? Um, yes. Okay, so you keep me posted. 2.15. Okay. okay. So, what did this look like in uh, territorial New Mexico? What did the system of Euro-American dominance uh, look like uh, and which was the greater context in which the Americanos were going to have to contend uh, with? So, uh, let's see, I think I... Political colonialism in New Mexico territory. So there are different levels to this structure of colonialism within the, uh, uh, within the federal system. The first is the control and rule that the federal government had over the territories. You know, an American territory was really an arm of Congress, and they had ultimate say over what went on in the territories. 
the residents of territory did not feel like they were full citizens because Congress could do whatever they wanted with the territory. They could veto any of the any of the laws that the territory passed, and very, quite importantly, the president appointed the governor of the territory. The president appointed the secretary of the territory. The president appointed the Supreme Court justices of the territory. And the president did this as under a system of patronage. So if someone helped the president get elected, then they would get an appointment as governor of New Mexico or the Utah Territory or, or whatever, right? Um, so there was that rule from the federal government that was uh, uh, that um, to which the Nomeicanos had to, uh, were subject to. Administrative rights. And so the actual administration of the territory by these Euro Americans who were sent down by the federal government in order to run um, the, uh, uh, the government and the judicial system. Um, there was a bias against the Mexicans. They have to make, for example, a very important one. Um, the legislature was dominated by Mexicans. And they would pass a law, but the governor had veto power. So if, if the Nomeicanos passed something that they thought was very important for their people as a whole, the governor could say no. So, um, so that was, uh, and, and, and very often then, um, that, that took place and became a point of contention. Um, the liberal whip. Okay, fine. So the American creed then likes to call itself inclusionist, and it likes to say that it grants civil rights, um, and it likes to say that if you're a citizen, then you're going to get the goodies and stuff. Uh, however, if the Mexicans did not behave like a good old middle-class American, then those settler colonialists in New Mexico could seek to uh, discipline um, those Mexicans and say, listen, you know, you're not getting with it here. And, you know, you're looking like backward hicks, and you better get with the program. And this happened a lot, you know. You know, you're not catching up. You know, um, this is actually uh, an issue that, that was common in Texas, too, and, and, and somewhat in California. In New Mexico, it could often be, become a concentrated uh, force within a particular election, for example. So that was another element of the structure of dominance. Racist settlers. And sometimes you had racists that were appointed governors and judges and stuff. But sometimes you had citizens, regular citizens who came into the territory and they were, you know, they were, they didn't like the Mexicans, and they let it be known. And they would write letters to the write letters to the editor, and they would send, you know, communications to Congress, and they would say these people, you know, they're a bunch of mongrels, and you know, they speak Spanish, and so therefore, you know, there's no way they can become part of the American Republic. Finally, assault on tradition. Um, the famous um, uh, ethno historian by the name of Eric Wolf, who has analyzed this uh, phenomenon. In, in imperial extensions throughout the world, especially capitalist ones, there was often the destruction of the traditional cultures, traditional institutions that were impacted by the imperial powers. Now, uh, if you know anything about New Mexico history, then you may be familiar with the land grant issue, the land grant that both Spanish and Mexican colonial um, land grants are, are, are a well-known example of how it is that in the 19th century, Euro-Americans came in and they found ways to finagle ripping off the lands that had belonged to the Mexicans. Uh, in actuality, though, that process really, you know, hit full force in the 1880s. Um, and so uh, there were other instances of assault on traditional Mexican culture that became politically consequential uh, in the uh, uh, between 1848 and the 1880s. Uh, there's, there's some complications around this whole issue, which maybe I'll have time to talk about, and maybe you'll, you'll see. Finally, there's resistance. <laughs> I mean, you have a, a system of, col of, of, of colonial dominance, and you tend to have resistance of one kind or another. Now, what tends to happen in many of these internal colonial situations is that the resistance took the form of secessionist movements or 
uh, or, or, or movements for autonomy for the territory and the part in, in which the Congo would be able to control. You know, Quebec, for example, is an example. The IRA in, in, in Ireland is an example. Uh, that's not what happened in New Mexico. Instead, what happened is that forms of resistance took place within this liberal, within this liberal framework that I am uh, setting up. Um, so this is what it looks like, um, and so um, the introduction gives much of this theory that I laid out for you in a little bit more detail. And then there's a chronological history that goes from the what New Mexico looked like on the eve of the American conquest, the first major block of this narrative, then deals with the uh, occupation in New Mexico because it was an important part of the war uh, between the United States and Mexico as the, as the United States invaded Mexico, one of the, one of the military expeditions was to send a commanding general to occupy New Mexico. So that's a very important part of the story here. Um, and then there is what I call the integrated conquest. There was the bloodless conquests, which is a, a myth about the conquest, American conquest in New Mexico. Uh, there was also the bloody conquest, the Taos Revolt, in which Mexicans actually physically, violently resisted the national occupation of their territory and killed the first American governor that was appointed to New Mexico. And then there was, within the time that the United States was occupying New Mexico, there was what I call an integrated conquest. Before the end of the war, there was already an election for delegates to a territory. That general who occupied New Mexico he claimed New Mexico was an American territory before the war was even over with. Um, so uh, then, uh, then I take the story down. May I, sh I probably should probably point down. I forgot to point down. So the the, the main storyline then is going to be one of the process of getting to the point of forming a two-party system in New Mexico. 1871 is when you see for the first time a fully organized Republican Party and a fully organized Democratic Party. I argue that it is a major stage in the integration of New Mexico. So within the complexity of all this is a core storyline of how it is that two major factions in the territory ended up finally forming this Republican and Democratic um, contention. Um, so I'll let you, you get totally confused by this, <laughs> uh, you can feast on it or uh, uh, as you like, and I guess maybe I should open it up for questions now. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask you, on the part of the assault on tradition, how does the, the formation of national parks kind of come into the picture? Do you see the national park system that was developed in New Mexico as part of the national the parks? National parks? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's not part of the story because the establishment of, of, of national parks really took place at the turn of the 20th century. Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, especially, but William McKinley, um, the, and so the 1890s and into the early part of the 20th century, when when the national parks were established and did their part to displace the land that the Mexicans owned at one time, the the, the floresta becomes a very important enemy to the land grant heirs. Uh, who you know see that the federal government is complicit with private individuals in ripping off the land and grabbing the land? So that's a that's a uh, well I hate to say this but that's my second book, <laughs> the next book that's that goes from the 1880s to 1912. So. Um, 
this was an extremely, you see, see this Mexican Democratic Party, the American Democratic Party. What happens, and the roots of this go back to here, is the uh, formation of two factions. And, uh, you know, there were Americans who filtered into New Mexico before um, the conquest. They were merchants, a lot of them, but they bef befriended a lot of the elite Mexicans. Those uh, Mexicans who partnered with those merchants were called the American Party. There were others like the priests who were very critical of these Americans who were coming in. And uh, uh, you know, they didn't want them because the, the Americans were getting very aggressive. Uh, they were intermarrying and then they were finding ways to, to, to get land that, that belonged to the Mexicans. So what I argue is that that uh, faction that developed in the Mexican period extends through the conquest, um, through uh, this whole period, and all the way to the formation of the Republican and Democratic parties. So uh, what happens in this period is an attempt to establish a Democratic party for New Mexico. The Mexican party and the American party, they duke it out to see who's going to form the Democratic party and who's going to uh, and who's going to um, who's going to form it and who's going to control it. Um, so, um, on the criteria of cultural identity, these are very modern constructions, very modern. The American Party, in terms of cultural identity, wanted assimilation of the Mexicans. They tended to be colorblind. They tended to say, "Don't be raising no racial issues. You know, you're just hurting yourselves and you're hurting the territory." And they called for cultural huh, huh, homogeneity. The Mexican Party advocated the retention of, tra of traditional culture, especially given the assault on traditional culture. They, they advocated confronting racism and the dominance of Euro Americans within the political system. And they assumed that the goal should be cultural pluralism within, within the American liberal framework. And so, and so these two parties then uh, Duke it out, the Mexican, the Mexican um, party win, establishes a, a Democratic Party in 1853, and uh, that starts the ball rolling. The American party then wins in the ne next election for delegate to Congress and establishes the American Democratic Party from 1854 to 1859. So, and this was an extremely uh, interesting battle. Um, so that, Jose Manuel Gallegos didn't speak a lick of English. Mm. And he went to Washington. <laughs> he was obviously a Mexican party kind of guy. Was he the priest? He was a former priest. And Jean Baptiste Lemay, and so this is one of the things that was different from the Mexican and the the, the American priests were not, you know, politicians in the American system, separation of church and state and all that. In the American system, in the Mexican, the priests were very important political actors. Now, what happens is that the American bishop who comes into New Mexico in 1850, he sets out to destroy the Mexican uh, Catholic Church. That was a very important part on the assault on tradition. Uh, Jose Manuel uh, Gallegos was, was, was one of the priests who was very critical of the Americans during the Mexican period. Jean Baptiste Lemay threw Jose Manuel Gallegos out of the church. That's an, an important motivator for him to run for delegate to Congress. And so the American Catholic system, which was a modernizing and liberal system, then became an important issue in the contention. Um, in both of these races. Miguel Antonio Otero, he was the most assimilated guy. You could, you know, he spoke English, he was a refined gentleman, he married a woman from the South, total opposite from Jose Manuel Gallego. 
And so they represented two prototypes of how to be an American for the Mexicans. Uh, Miguel Antonio Otero was educated in St. Louis and Washington before the conquest. Very Americanized. His family collaborated with the occupation of New Mexico. So you have these two parties, those who resist the American intrusion and those who collaborate with it. And so that's a very important part of the, of the political integration process. Um, yes, sir? I have a question. Um, well, actually, I have three questions. Um, <laughs> so, so the first one, um, you know, so I can see that the, me the, the no Mexicano population is, uh, is integrated into the political system. Does that mean, you know, all of this is before the 14th Amendment. They were kind of declared to be white by the, by the federal state. Um, yes. Is there an, okay, first question. Yeah, you had to be white to be a citizen. Right. So that's, does that include all Nuevo Mexicanos, or, or are some disenfranchised if they're like Native Americans or whatever? Um, Native Americans were not considered white. And they were not citizens? They were not citizens. Okay, so what's the criteria? You speak Spanish, or how was that operation? Uh, first question. Say something about race. Second question. So you have a sort of framework of internal colonialism. Um, how is, you know, I'm going on memory here because I read this a long time ago, but I remember Acuña's account of New Mexico, Rodolfo Acuña's, uh, is a theory of internal colonialism, right? Yes, 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 which he abandoned. Uh, oh, he did? Oh, oh yeah, no, his most recent versions are given in America, um, leaves it out. Oh. And he has talked about this in his blog. Oh, yeah. oh. So, how, okay, so let's take the one I know from the way from way back from Occupied mm -hmm. America. So, in what way is your version of internal colonialism different from his. And I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, as I recall, and I'm speaking from memory, there's a lot of emphasis on the struggle between like uh, cattle ranchers and sheep herders, you know, kind of settlers struggling for the land in New Mexico in the 80s, in Acuna. Right. So um, I'm, I'm talking about prior to know, that period. Right. And I'm waiting for the second book. It's the one I want to read, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the one about, why citizenships? I mean, why statehood so late? But anyway, and then, so my third question is, um, yeah, going back to this, and I guess it's after your period, you know, in terms of these, these confrontations, which I guess were pretty big in the 1880s, uh, over the land and so on, um, you, you know, why is the theory of internal colonialism counterposed to the kind of Marxist theory? Because I'm thinking of Montejano. You know, uh, he says uh, the structure of the peace. So long as there were big ranches, uh, there was peace a peace. Structure, in the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the structural peace. Yeah. And then when that class structure changed, then, then the peace between Mexicans and Anglos uh, yeah. changed. And it is compatible with a theory of uh, internal colonialism, or is it not? Anyway, those are the three. Well, uh, I mean, one of the things that makes internal colonialism more applicable to New Mexico is that the United States, I mean, political scientists a long time ago defined the federal uh, the federal territory as a colony. The way the United States administered the, the federal colony was very similar to the way that the British administered their, their, external, uh, their external colonies. The difference between me and the is, is the role of capitalism. The role of capitalism but, in Texas... But, but time out, time out. You know, so the Anglos <laughs> come into California, right? Uh, it's the same war in 1848. 100,000 Anglo settlers come to San Francisco for the gold rush. And in 1849, 50, this place becomes a state yeah. right away. Right. Um, you know, so so the, you know, that has something to do with race and demographics, right? I mean, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. In 1850 in California, 1912 in New Mexico, something's different, then, right? No doubt about it. And you know, many argued that there was, that the Californians were were colonized, uh, the Californians were colonized, and there's. There's there's nothing wrong, you know. Internal colonialism is a concept. There's nothing wrong with uh, with saying that, with uh, 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 claiming that that was a variation on internal colonialism, because you know their uh, their whole status was a result of an imperial conquest. I don't have I don't have any problems with that. I am uh, I am looking at internal colonialism from a structural standpoint, and so I want to highlight some of the things that really gives internal colonialism structural weight to it. And so um, the assault on tradition was an important part of the California experience. It was a, an important part of the Tejano experience, too. Um, the way that, they, you know, Carrie McWilliams uh, called Southwest the broken border, 
in which he emphasized that uh, they were part of the same, you know, um, uh, national state in, in Mexico, yet they were not integrated unto themselves. And so that meant that they had, um, they had, uh, they went through, you know, some, some important differences uh, as they were being incorporated into the United States. I mean, the, the, when I teach my class on, on Mexican Americans, I like to make the comparison to slavery in the South. And slavery in the South spanned, it was a socioeconomic system that spanned, you know, a humongous region, and which uh, in, included African Americans within a, what can be seen as a single master system of domination. That was not what happened in the Southwest. There were very, very important differences, even though they went through similar experiences of conquest and forced incorporation into, you know, the, the amount of racism that occurred in Texas did not occur in New Mexico. The lynching, all of that lynching that happened in Texas, you didn't see that in New Mexico because there was room for power sharing. You know, the role of the Mexicanos were able to look after their interests within within the uh, within the the the, the, the uh, first uh, th four four or five decades decades in New Mexico allowed for some struggle to be able to establish themselves with some influence over the development of the of the uh, um, uh, of the territory. However, so up until up until the eighteen eighties. The Mexicans were able to hold their own, mm -hmm. right? As shown by the delegate to Congress. And during the 1880s, when the railroad comes in, you know, and more and more Euro Americans start coming into New Mexico, and these are ambitious men who come in, let me tell you, and they're representing corporate, the corporate Republican Party, you know, and they know New Mexico is going to become a state soon, and they're going to start. And, and, and New Mexico is going to become much more valuable because it's going to become, going to become a state. And the demographic shift, so the number of Mexicans starts to go down as the Euro-American settler goes up. Oh my God, you know, these guys become ambitious as hell. And look at the difference. Look at this. I mean, it's amazing. There's a, and it's very complicated. This guy here was a native no mexicano. This guy here was a native no mexicano. Octaviano Garrasolo was accepted as a no mexicano even though he was born in Mexico. But look at the proportions. I mean, it's you know it, the colonial onslaught in New Mexico actually took place in the 1880s. Up until then, then the Mexicans were able to struggle and fight and to be able to uh, and to carve out. A position for themselves within the political system. Okay, now mm -hmm. this guy here is <coughs> complicated, and there are a lot of people who thought that he, that who think that he's he's a no Mexicano, but actually, he came from a Portuguese-speaking family, a couple who moved to Santa Fe in the 1840s from the Azores. So, uh, so he he was raised in Santa Fe, right along no Mexicanos, and a lot of people think that he's a no Mexicano, but Really, he was an immigrant, you know, an, an immigrant, you know, who established himself in connection to Euro-American uh, merchants in Taos, uh, and so, and he became a dominant force. Uh, as a Democrat, you have to understand that what happens by this time is that the vast majority of the Mexicans are Republican. They go over to the Republican Party, but it's but it but you know, from one presidential to election to another, then it shifts. But the point being. And the other, and, 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 and the representation of no Mexicanos in the territorial uh, legislature starts to go down precipitously as New Mexico comes closer to statehood in 1912. So that's part of the story that's going on here. This is something that happened in New Mexico that didn't happen in Texas and California. This ability to, to be able to take advantage of the these weapons um, of, uh, of electoral politics and citizenship and uh, enlightenment rhetoric and to be able to carve out a space uh, for their, to look out for their interests. So it lasted for a while but didn't last forever. The true colonial onslaught started to take place then. 
uh, as I say, in the 1880s. It is an important part of understanding what was going on in terms of Euro-American dominance uh, in, in, um, in the Southwest as a whole and, and in New Mexico in particular. Miriam. So two questions. Um, how settled was New Mexico when it came into the U.S., so the 1848? Like, what's the, how much of the land is taken at that point? How, how many people are there? How spread out are they? That's one. And then secondly, did the U.S. kind of take any, any lessons from the New Mexico case and apply it to the Puerto Rico case? Because Puerto Rico, that happens... 50 years later, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, you know, it's with some some similarities that you've yeah. alluded to, mm -hmm. uh, but one difference is it's continued to be right. this a, a colonial state, not a yeah. you know. So I mean, I can think of one thing right off the bat in terms of geographically where it's located. But is there anything you know, anything you see in what happened? in the Mexico case that you say, oh, this is kind of very consciously done differently in the Puerto Rico case, or? Let me, let me address the first question. So I apologize for this map, because it's anachronistic. You understand there was no I-40, you know, <laughs> back, in the, back in the 1840s, right? So the, the, the traditional, and there was no New Mexico-Colorado line either. So the traditional New Mexican homeland extended from the upper watersheds of, of Colorado. Um, they were populated, settled through here, all through this region, coming down into Santa Fe and out over into San Miguel County. That was the known as the Rio Arriba district of the Mexican department. From Santa Fe down to about Socorro uh, was the um, uh, Rio Abajo district. And so these were the core segments of what was uh, the, the New Mexican department prior to the conquest in, eight, in the 1840s. This whole area here, which is really you know, part of Chihuahua, more than part of New Mexico originally, will eventually, and it was going to be part of my story, is going to be the integration of this section of New Mexico within the political system. And in fact, these guys tended to be very mad because they felt like they were not given enough attention from Santa Fe, and many of them went with the South during the, during the uh, Civil War, and even called for secession from New Mexico, or, or even, there were Tejanos who fought in the Confederacy too. Um, uh, so there's that. So that, that, that is the, 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 the traditional uh, New Mexican homeland uh, region. My dad's family, by the way, comes from a little string of villages where? Right down here in the Pickles, Pickles River. Right there is where my, my dad was born and raised in a little place called Sena there. And I remember there's some here, there's a land grant, which we lost, you know. Uh, but that didn't happen until uh, eight, like 1897, uh, not any earlier than that. There were, in fact, lessons that were taken from the New Mexico case um, for Puerto Rico. And John Nieto Phillips has written some excellent essays on this, mm -hmm. on this particular topic. And so the, um, the attempt at a sort of forced assimilation, which, which was an important part of the New Mexican experience, especially into the 20th century, there, there was more of a um, uh, more of allowance of the Puerto Ricans to be able to have control over their, you know, over their cultural systems, speaking of Spanish, and that's why you have Spanish spoken so widespread in, in, in Puerto Rico, but not in New Mexico, because in New Mexico, you know, Senator Beveridge in 1902 single-handedly kept New Mexico from becoming a state because he spoke Spanish. So there were some very different, um, different policies that were undertaken in the case of Puerto Rico from, uh, uh, from New Mexico, and I can give you that reference if you're interested in that you know, essay that John wrote. One more question. One more question. Go ahead. No, no, okay. no, no, no. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to explain the the entire uh, the entire narrative that I have to tell. Uh, let me just uh, leave you with something that will hopefully will keep you from sleeping. What the heck is going on here? <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. 
so one of the interesting, th interesting things has to do with not only the incorporation of positive aspects of Mexican culture, but also some of the negative ones. Debt peonage is an example. Mm -hmm. that, and, and how do you deal with debt peonage under a liberal system? Well, you know, that was, a, that was an important. So uh, in, in this particular case, uh, Jose Francisco Chavez is running against Charles Cleaver. Charles Cleaver was uh, from Prussia, a Prussian immigrant. Um, and uh, one of the important sources for my whole story is the Spanish language sources, which historians have not looked at to the depth that they should have. And so what happens is that, is that when Jose Francisco Chavez is nominated for delegate to Congress, uh, Jose D. Santa is a sheriff of Santa Fe County. He gives a speech seconding the, uh, the, uh, the nomination. And in criticizing Cleaver, he says, uh, criticizing the backers of Cleaver, he says something like, only the most vile descendants of Israel could have supported someone like Charles Cleaver. Oh my God. <laughs> An incredible burst of anti Semitism it comes out. And it's very literary and it's all in Spanish. And, um, and these were folks who belonged to the Mexican party. I tended to favor the Mexican party in this whole thing, but that one was a little bit difficult to take, but it was, uh, but it was fun writing and not. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.